Thank you for joining us for this sermon podcast from the Congregational Church of Needham, Massachusetts, United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're invited and welcome. Today's sermon for Sunday, September 20th, 2020, is the first in a series of three sermons for the season of creation, this entitled Creation as Sacrament, Finding God in the World. It's a reflection on a brief scripture, Romans chapter 1, verse 20, and a longer poem, The Farm, by Wendell Berry. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to learn more about our open and affirming ministries at the Congregational Church of Needham, simply head over to our website, www.needhamucc.org. Thank you. A standard definition of a sacrament is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. Traditionally in the church, the sacraments have been defined dogmatically as those rites considered to have been instituted by Christ, just two for Protestants, baptism and communion, or by the church, a total of seven for Catholics. But since all of creation, everything that is, that ever was or ever will be, has been instituted by God, that is, has been shaped by God's hand and is a reflection of who and how God is, perhaps we can read the world as a sacrament, not as a rite, but as a relationship, not as dogma, but as lived experience. Perhaps we can come to know God and ourselves better by reflecting on how the world wordlessly reflects our relationship with God, our neighbors, and ourselves back to us. In this season of pandemic, when our usual ways of relating to one another for good or for ill have been so radically altered, I know many of us have found ourselves outside in nature more often and more consistently than we have in years. We've been hiking or kayaking or strolling along the beach. We're walking our neighborhoods more intentionally, noticing the details in a new way. We've taken to just sitting on our porches and watching the world go by. At the same time, so many of our so many fewer face-to-face human interactions have been relocated outdoors as well. And we've marveled at sunsets eerily refracted by smoke from wildfires an entire continent away. And at the power of a tiny half-alive virus to bring the entire world to its knees. We are, I dare say, more keenly aware that we are a part of and not apart from the rest of creation in this moment. Over the course of this summer, I found a new rhythm for myself, coming here to the church building to tend to the COVID memorial flags out on the lawn and the mammoth sunflowers we grew from seedlings in pots also out there. I watered them, staked them, pruned them, mulched them. I had an ongoing argument with some small animal or another about whether that mulch belonged in the pots or strewn around outside. I watched, fascinated, as the bees made their busy work over the massive sundial faces of the flowers. And now I'm watching as those same flowers now spent, fail and fall and scatter their seeds because there is a time for every purpose under heaven. And now is the time for their diminishment. Poet Wendell Berry was born in 1934 in Henry County, Kentucky. He lived and studied and wrote and spoke all across the country And then in 1965, he returned home to his family farm. 
and inspired by a habit of Sunday walks over the course of the next 33 years, from 1979 to 2012. He wrote a series of poems reflecting on the intersection of faith, nature, life, work, and rest. In other words, he wrote about our human life, the life of the wider world, and the deep life of the divine he saw reflected in the world around him. The rest of our sermon time today is taken from one of those Sabbath poems titled The Farm. And so I'm going to encourage you, if you like, if you've not already, you can even turn off the video or just close your eyes and listen to this poem. Let it speak to your heart, not just your head, but let it move deeper inside. And let's reflect on the world as sacrament. The Farm by Wendell Berry. Go by the narrow road along the creek, a burrow under shady trees, such as a mouse makes through tall grass, so that you may forget the wide road you have left behind and all that it has led to. Or best, walk up through the woods, around the valley rim, and down to where the trees give way to cleared hillside so that you reach the place out of the tree's remembrance of their kind. Seasonal and timeless, they stand in uncounted time, and you have passed among them, small as a mouse at a feast, unnoticed at the feet of all those mighty guests. Come on a clear June morning as the fog lifts, trees drip, and birds make everywhere uninterrupted song. However you may come, you'll see it suddenly lie open to the light amid the woods, a farm. Little enough to see or call across, cornfield, hayfield, and pasture clear as if remembered, dreamed, and yearned for long ago, neat as a blossom now with all the pastures mowed and the dew fresh upon it, bird music all around. That is the vision, seen as on a Sabbath walk, the possibility of human life whose terms are heaven's and this earth's. Stay years if you would know the work and thought, the pleasure and grief, the feet by which this vision lives. In fall or winter, you should plow a patch of bottomland for corn. The freezes then will work the heavy clods. When it's too wet to plow, go to the woods to fell trees for next winter's fuel. Take the inferior trees, and not all from one place, so that the woods will yield without diminishment. Then trim and rick the logs. And when you drag them out from woods to rick, use horses whose hooves are kinder to the ground than wheels. In spring, the traces of your work will be invisible. Near winter's end, your flock will bear their lambs, and you must be alert, out late and early, at the barn, to guard against the grief you cannot help but feel when any young thing made for life falters at birth and dies. Save the best hay to feed the suckling ewes. Shelter them in the barn until the grass is strong, then turn them out to graze the green hillsides. Good pasture with shade and water close. Then watch for dogs, whose sport will be to kill your sheep and ruin all your work. Or old coyote may become your supper guest, unasked and without thanks. He'll just excerpt a lamb and dine before you know it. 
but don't, because of that, make war against the world and its wild appetites. A guard dog or a jenny would be the proper answer. Or use electric fence. For you must learn to live with neighbor, neighbors never chosen as with the ones you chose. Coyote's song at midnight says something for the world the world wants said. And when you know your flock is safe, you'll like to wake and hear that wild voice sing itself free in the dark at home. As the fields dry, complete your plowing. You must do this as early as you can. Then dig and drag the furrows. And now the past must come to serve the future. Dung and straw from the barn floor you carry to the fields. Load after load until the barns are clean, the cropland all covered with manure. In early May, prepare the corn ground, plant the corn. And now you are committed. Wait for the seed to sprout. The green shoots tightly rolled to show above the ground as risen from the grave. Then you must cultivate to keep them free of weeds until they have grown tall and can defend themselves. Where you grew corn last year, sow buckwheat. Let it seed, then disk it in and grow a second crop to disk in. This is for hummus and to keep out weeds. It is a Sabbath for the land, rest and enrichment. Good for it, for you, for all the ones who are unborn. The land must have its Sabbath or take it when we starve. The ground is mellow now, freeable and porous, rich. Mid-August is the time to sow this field in clover and grass, to cut for hay two years, pasture a while, and then return to corn. But don't neglect your garden. Household economy makes family and land an independent state. Never buy at a store what you can grow or find at home. This is the rule of liberty, also of neighborhood. And be faithful to local merchants, too. Never buy far off what you can buy near home. As early as you can, plant peas, onions, and greens. Potatoes, radishes, cabbage, and cauliflower. Lettuce, carrots, and beets. Things that will stand the frost. Then, as the weather warms, plant squashes, corn, and beans. Okra, tomatoes herbs, flowers, some for yourself and some to give away. In the cornfield, plant pole beans, pumpkins, and winter squash. Thus, by diversity, you can enlarge the yield. You have good grass and hay, so keep a cow or two. Milk made from your own grass is cheap and sweet. A cow to milk is a good excuse to bring you home from places you do not want to be. Fatten the annual calf for slaughter. Keep a pig to rescue scraps, skimmed milk, and other surpluses. Keep hens who will make eggs and meat of offal, insects, a little of your corn. Eat these good beasts that eat what you can't. Be thankful to them and to the plants to your small, fertile homeland, to topsoil, light, and rain that give you daily life. Be thankful and repay growth with good work and care. Work done in gratitude, kindly and well, is prayer. You did not make yourself, yet you must keep yourself by use of other lives. No gratitude atones for bad use or too much. This is not work for hire. By this expenditure, you make yourself a place. You make yourself a way for love to reach the ground. In its ambition and its greed, its violence 
The world is turned against this possibility, and yet the world survives by the survival of this kindly working love. And while you work your fields, do not forget the woods. The woods stands by the field to measure it and teach its keeper. Nature is the best farmer, for she preserves the land, conserves the rain. She deepens soil, wastes nothing, and she is diverse and orderly. She is our mother, teacher, and final judge on earth. The farm's a human order, opening amid the trees, remembering the woods. To farm, live like a tree that does not grow beyond the power of its place. It rises by the strength of local soil and light, aspiring to no height that it has not attained. More time, more light, more rain will make it grow again till it has realized all that it can become. And then it dies into more life, deserving more by not desiring more. The year's, full, the year's first fullness comes to the hayfields. In May, watching the sky, you mow your fields before the grass toughens and while the clover stands in its early bloom. But weather's iffy here in May, and in these close valleys, the early cutting is hard to cure. Some rain will fall on swath or windrow as like as not to darken the hay. Well, it beats a snowball, you say then to console yourself, and look ahead to later cuttings, lighter, better, quicker to dry. In summer, thus, you think of winter, load the barns in heat against the cold. The January days when you'll go out to feed, your breath a little cloud, the blue air glittery with frost. On the tracked snow, on ground that's frozen hard, you free the smell of summer from bales of hay thrown down before the hungry stock. Soon you have salad greens out of the garden rows, then peas, early potatoes, onions, beets, beans, sweet corn. The bounty of the year now comes in like a tide, yellow summer squashes, pole beans from the cornfield, tomatoes, okra, eggplant, cabbage, and cauliflower. Eat and give to the neighbors. Preserve for winter time. Plant more and fight the weeds. Later will come the fall crops, turnips, parsnips, more greens, the winter squashes, cumshaws and pumpkins big as tubs. Too much for us, you'll say, and give some more away, or try to. Nowadays, a lot of people would rather work hard to buy their food already cooked than get it free by work. Best of all is the fruit, sweetest and prettiest. The strawberries and cherries, the gooseberries and currants, raspberries and blackberries, the best are wild. Grapes, pears, apples, early and late. These gleaming in the sun that gleam upon the tongue and gleam put up in jars and gleam within the mind. Of all your harvests, those are pleasantest that come freest. Blackberries from wild fence rows, Strawberries you happen on in crossing the grassy slopes in June. Wild cherries and wild grapes, sour at first taste, then sweet. Persimmons and black haws that you gather and eat on days you walk among the red and yellow leaves. And walnuts, hickory nuts gathered beneath the trees. In your wild foragings, the earth feeds you the way she feeds the beasts and birds. And all the summer long, you're putting up more hay. You clip the pastures, keep the fences up, repair your buildings, milk your cows. You wean the lambs, you move the livestock to new grass. And you must walk the fields with hoe in hand to cut the thistles and the docks. There is no end to work. 
work done in pleasure, grief, or weariness, with ease of skill and timeliness, or awkwardly, or wrong, too hurried or too slow. One job completed shows another to be done. And so you make the farm that must be, that must be daily made and yearly made, or it will not exist. If you should go and not return and none should follow you, this clarity would be as if it never was. But praise in knowing this, the genius of this place, whose ways forgive your own and will resume again in time, if left alone. You work always in this dear opening between what was and is to be. And so you make the farm. And so you disappear into your days and your days into the ground. Before you start each day, the place is as it is. And at the day's end, it is as it is. A little changed by work, but still itself, having included you and everything you've done. And it is who you are, and you are what it is. You will work many days no one will ever see. Their record is the place. This way, you come to know that something moves in time that time does not contain. For by this timely work, you keep yourself alive as you came into time. And as you'll leave, God's dust, God's breath, a little light. To rest, go to the woods, where what is made is made without your thought or work. Sit down. Begin the wait for small trees to grow big, feeding on earth and light. Their good result is song the winds must bring, that trees must wait to sing and sing longer than you can wait. Soon you must go. The trees, your seniors, standing thus acknowledged in your eyes, stand as your praise and prayer. Your rest is in this praise of what you cannot be and what you cannot do. But make your land recall in work days of the fields, the Sabbath of the woods. Although your fields must bear the barbed seed of the fall, though nations yet make war for madness and for hire, by work in harmony with the God-given world, you bring your days to rest. Remain a living soul. In time of hate and waste, Wars and rumors of wars, rich armies and poor peace. Your blessed economy, beloved sufficiency upon a dear small place, sings with the morning stars. Autumn ripens the corn. You pick the yellow ears, carry them from the field, rich, satisfying loads. The garden's final yield now harvested, the ground worked and manured, prepared for spring, put out of mind. You must saw, split, bring in and store your winter wood. And thus the year comes round. Friends, if you have word, heard the word of God this morning, Remember to all give all honor and glory to our one God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Amen.